Hi everyone, uh, my name is Gray McDonnell. I'm the Senior Director of Brand and Creative for Time. I'm also the former International Creative Director for the New York Times. Uh, this presentation is around how to supercharge your storytelling with design. Um, there's gonna be some Q&A at the end, so if you've got any questions about anything that I speak about, feel free to pop them in the chat and we can chat about that at the end. Um, so this is my dad. Now my dad's 85 years old. Uh, he's fitter than me, he can run faster than me easily, but like most people uh, my age with parents, he hasn't got a clue what I do for a living. So he knows that I work in journalism, but he, so he's like, oh, you must be a journalist. So I'm like, no, you know, I do create stories, but it's more the sort of creative side, you know, like design and visuals. He's like, oh, great. So you, you designed the magazine then? I'm like, not quite. So, I mean, we do do a lot of print work, but most of the stuff we do is digital now. So it's online kind of interactive experiences. So he's like, oh, great. Now I get it. So you must make the website. So I'm like, no, not exactly. So I thought, fair enough. The things I do and my job role and sort of my day to day isn't exactly black and white. So I thought, I wonder what the easiest way I can sum this up for him would be. So I showed him this. Um, now, as much as I'd like to think of myself as a sort of James Bond type style, that my job isn't that exciting really. But what I'm really talking about is this product placement. So when you think about it, Branded content is almost like product placement for journalism. So the same way that Aston Martin reaped the benefits when James Bond drives one of their cars, it can be hugely beneficial for uh, if an article from a trusted publisher promotes your product or service in a sort of genuinely engaging story. Um, so the same thing happens with kind of social media influencers. So when they receive money from brands to promote a product in their feed, it's effectively just product placement. But there's a common trap that a lot of advertisers fall into when trying to create branded content. Let me get you some help, Truman. You're not well. Why do you want to have a baby with me? You can't stand me. That's not true. Why don't you let me fix you some of this new mo cocoa drink? All natural cocoa beans from the upper slopes of Mount Nicaragua, no artificial sweeteners. What the hell are you talking about? Who are you talking to? I've tasted other cocos. This is the best. What the hell does this have to do with anything? Tell me what's happening! So, you know, it's really trendy at the moment to talk about uh, seeing yourself as a disruptor, but people forget just how frustrating it is to be disrupted. Uh, people's capacity for this is rapidly diminishing. And we as human beings were sort of engineered to maximize our signal to noise ratio. Um, our willingness to be inconvenienced or interrupted is dwindling day by day. And the problem is that the market is just completely saturated with ads. So in short, we need to stop interrupting what people are interested in and be what people are interested in. And that's where branded content comes in. So in a perfect world, branded content is content that looks like, sounds like, and feels like the native content that it sits alongside. The only real difference is that a brand has paid the publisher to make sure the content promotes their product or service in a particular way. Now, obviously this is a very simplified view of how branded content works, but in a nutshell, it's essentially what branded content is. Um, and when done properly, branded content should be indistinguishable from the native content that it sits alongside. Uh, it should have the same quality, same tone and the same standards that the audience have come to expect from the content that they arrive at your platform for. Now, a lot of clients come to us uh, uh, saying the same sort of thing. You know, we want a video or we want VR or we want a podcast. And we go back with the same answer every time. It's really important to figure out the story first and then how to tell it afterwards. Even in the word itself, story comes before the telling. So that's a, a, a key part of how to create branded content in an engaging way.
Now everyone loves a good story because it is built into our DNA uh, and you can track this all the way back to cave paintings and hieroglyphics and storytelling is a vital tool for humans to pass on information and to learn lessons from each other. And research has shown that the chemical makeup of your brain actually changes when you're engaged with a story and it can actually cause you to develop opinions and thoughts and ideas that align with the person that's telling that particular story. But what makes a story a good one? Um, and it really, it's all about creating a journey and making it relevant to the audience. Uh, and the way you do that is there's a very simple formula that all good stories follow. And you might know this as the narrative arc. So the first thing you've got to do is introduce an element. Now, this is usually a character of some sort, uh, it's probably someone the audience likes. Uh, at the very least, they have to be emotionally invested in what happens to this person, and they have to care about um, what happens to them throughout the journey. So this is the hook of the story. The second thing you need to do is introduce some sort of hurdle for them to tackle. So this could be a bad guy for them to defeat. It could be a physical challenge for them to overcome. It could be some sort of emotional demon for them to tackle. Um, and most corporate stories fail because they lack this element that makes a good story and that's conflict. And then the final thing is the pot of gold at the end of the story. So showing the audience the result. Um, this could be some kind of reward, it could be physical, it could be emotional or whatever. The tension leads to attention and the attention then leads to us sharing this emotional connection with the character in the story. So the next time you read a book, the next time you hear a joke, watch a movie, nine times out of 10, stories will follow these three steps. So I come from a big family. I've got 18 nephews and nieces. So Christmases are always fun at my, my, my place, but Anyone that's around kids or has, you know, got parents, got kids of their own will tell you it's really, really difficult to get kids to eat their vegetables. But there is a simple trick to get them to do this, and that's to hide it in something they like. So this is a, a slight twist on a great uh, presentation by a guy called Doug Stevenson, and he introduces his great metaphor. So the vegetable is the product or service that you're trying to promote, and the smoothie is a story that's hidden um, all, all of those um, brand messages. So the thing you want a person to consume is much, much, much more digestible if it's hidden within an amazingly tasty story. Um, and a good example of this is a program we ran for um, Ally Bank. Um, so the percentage of black business owners in the United States actually rose to an all-time high back in uh, 2017. But that all-time high was just 3.5%. So Ally wanted us to help them address this. So every year they run this event called Moguls in the Making where they help students from historically black colleges and universities and they give them workshops, help them to identify opportunities and raise awareness, awareness of the uh, issues at large. So what we did is we followed five of these entrepreneurs on their personal stories. We met their families, we saw their lives, we saw how their uh, lives changed after this event. So again, going back to our smoothie analogy, this is a message you want them to consume so you deliver it in something that is much, much more digestible. So the brand message is obviously promoting Ally's event, but the actual story, the vehicle that we hold it in is these personal stories of these five entrepreneurs. It's a much, much more uh, human way to connect with audiences and that's what makes it more digestible. So this is a great quote, content marketing is like a first date. If you only talk about yourself, there won't be a second one. Uh, so I love this and it's something that I talk to clients about a lot and it's, you know, for Ally, we could have done a story about how amazing this event was and about how amazing Ally are for, for running it. But instead, like I say, what we did is we told these personal stories of these five entrepreneurs instead, and this was much, much more effective. Um, because it's really tempting as a brand to position yourself as the hero of the story, but this is a big, big, big mistake. So the protagonist of the story should never be the brand. It should be the audience who are watching it. 
Uh, in the most successful stories, the audience should be able to identify with themselves uh, with the person making the journey within the story itself. And the brand's role is to be the reason that the lead character succeeds. So positioning the lead character as the hero of the story, as the lead character, this solidifies their reliance on this guide um, if they're going to achieve their goals. And as a, a sort of intended byproduct, they come to trust uh, the brand as a figure of authority, um, knowledge, value, um, and it really does position them in a much, much higher regard than if they just sing and dance about themselves. Um, so the biggest challenge there is trying to get that story in the first place. So let's assume we have this story that we want to tell. Execution is just as important as a story, but it can never be a substitute. So how you tell a story is just as important as the story itself, but how well it's received is all about how you execute it. And sometimes it's really easy to think, you know, oh, well, we've got sort of half a story. It's not that great, but we'll make up for it by making it anime or doing it in VR. Uh, that'll make it more interesting, but that's not really how it works. Um, there are a million ways to tell a story. And obviously there isn't one silver bullet. There isn't one way that says you are guaranteed engagement if you do it in this way. Uh, but what I will say is it's really important to figure out the right format for your story um, that you're trying to tell. Um, so VR was a really hot topic a couple of years ago. And a lot of our clients were like, right, we're going to do uh, VR films. It'll, you know, everyone wants to engage with these things. But the, the reality is a lot of these films would be much, much more successful if they were standard videos. That being said, execution can be a really powerful tool um, to enhance a story if it's used in the right way. So a while back, we used to, when we were doing our storytelling, we used to use a bunch of like hugely interactive stories that had rollovers and tooltips and sliders. But what we found is it's actually really, really difficult to get users to actually do anything. In fact, if you want them to do anything other, other than just scroll, something spectacular has to happen as a result. The payoff of what the user gets has to be worth the investment that they put in, and their investment is attention and time. When information is cheap, attention becomes expensive because getting attention isn't actually that difficult, uh, but it's sustaining it that is difficult in the long run. Um, and in reality, there isn't really anything, any such thing as an attention span. It's only the quality of what it is that you're consuming. Um, now you can take entire university courses that are dedicated on how to get attention, retain attention, keep engagement. Um, and obviously working for big publishers, we, we've got huge data teams that are dedicated to tweaking the details and the, the smallest points that improve performance. Um, and I'm just going to touch upon a few simple things that you can do to help keep that engagement um, throughout. So the first one is the most obvious thing. It's to make it visual. Um, so again, going back to the investment payoff scale, we see content as a much smaller cognitive lift if it's presented in a much more digestible chunks. The stats support it. There are millions of them. Visuals are processed 60,000 times faster than words. There are all sorts of stats that back this up. Um, and better yet, you can replace whole paragraphs of words with visuals um, with just one image. Um, so it's something to think about when delivering chunks of text is, is there a visual way that we can communicate the same point? Now, I can't take credit for the covers that we produce at Time, but Time really are the kind of OGs of doing this. Like the power of visuals um, can help, help complicated uh, subjects really easy to understand. They communicate scale in ways that words alone can't do. And obviously Time and their covers and their visuals and the power of this uh, is a really, really good example of this. The second one is make it move. And, and simply put, movement attracts attention. So our minds, as human beings, we're engineered to highlight the, the visual differences in our visual field. And this comes from our sort of primal need as animals to sort of constantly scan the horizons to spot if anything has changed. Motion warning. 
This section will include a video of scrolling that may be excessive motion for some. This was a great example the New York Times newsroom did a couple of years ago when the fire at Notre Dame broken down. Um, they could have easily have done this using static imagery, but instead the movement made it much, much more engaging and uh, helped capture that attention in the first place. Aside from just getting attention, movement can also be a good way uh, to sort of distract the user away from things you don't want them to notice. Um, so it's a little bit like the way a magician uses misdirection. It's the reason things like preloaders exist. So instead of giving you just nothing to look at, it kind of tricks the brain into thinking time is moving faster so you don't actually notice all these things loading uh, in the background. The third one is to make it interactive. So this is leveling up, uh, getting a uh, reward for something and getting that feedback uh, for achieving something. It gives you that little rush. But as we saw earlier, getting audiences to actually interact with anything is really, really, really difficult. And it usually comes down to three different things. So the first one is motivation, giving them a reason to do it. Like if they interact with this thing, what are they going to get as a result? Um, the second one is ability. Do they, th do they think it's within their capability to achieve this? Is it easy enough for them to complete? And then the third one is a trigger. So are there any cues, any signals or pointers that encourage them to actually take this action in the first place? Um, nobody's going to interact with anything unless they realize that something is interactive. Um, and what that all means from a sort of game, gamification point of view is it gives that sense of achievement and that little dopamine hit that they've achieved their goal. Um, the fourth thing, and probably one of the most important things, is to make it obvious. So there's a saying that says UX design is like a good joke. If you have to explain it, then it isn't actually very good. So you have to make user interfaces instinctive enough that users just simply know what to do. They don't have to learn what to do. The good example of this is when you think of mazes. So when you think of a maze, you've got lots and lots of different options around a maze. Some of them end your journey short. You've got no idea to come back. Uh, you've no idea what you're in for, uh, what journey to take. And there's a lot of decisions that you have to make as you go around it in order to hit the, the goal at the end. Now, a labyrinth might be just as long, might contain the same amount of information, but it's one single path um, that guides you all the way through. You don't have to make any choices. You simply know how to get around and you can focus on what it is you're actually there for. You just don't have to think, you just know instinctively what to do there. Motion warning. This section will include a video of scrolling that may be excessive motion for some. This was a piece that um, I designed for all birds um, and it kind of follows all of these rules in one. So the first thing is it's very, very visual. So that's a good thing for sort of getting users' attention. Um, you'll notice that it's animated, but only subtly. So uh, it doesn't overload uh, the audience with um, sort of sensory overload at once. Um, there is interactivity within this, but it's used to sort of enhance the piece rather than sort of distract the users from the story itself. And all the user has to do on this piece is scroll. There's no learning curve, there's one path. Um, the content is delivered in one single narrative um, arc. So I'm not saying that VR is bad or podcasts are bad and to never do animation, but what I'm saying is the magic combination of a good story executed in the right way is the experience that everybody should be aiming for. You've got to do what's right for the story and do it well. So just to kind of sum up, I guess you hear time and time again uh, that content is king. Uh, but if that's true, then execution is the castle because you could have the best content in the world, but it won't be effective if you don't find the best way to bring it to life. So just to, some key takeaways. The first one is to hide the vegetables. Do not talk directly about the brand message within your story. You create a story around the brand message and have them digest that as a byproduct. Um, the second one is to use that narrative arc, um, introduce an element, give them some sort of conflict or some sort of hurdle to overcome, and then present the, the result of the outcome to your audiences. And then the third one is obviously to keep them engaged. 
Again, it's really, really, really easy to get attention, but retaining it is where the skill comes in. I've been Graham McDonnell, and thank you for your time.